All right, great. Well, welcome everybody to the July 2021 edition of Streets for All Happy Hour. We are so excited to have Professor Don Shoup here, who literally wrote the book on parking. Before we get to our special guests, we're going to give you an update on state measures that we've been tracking, give you an update on our Destruction for Nava campaign, uh, talk about the Gateway City's COGS, a few wins of the month. We have a fun trivia edition to this edition of, of Happy Hour, and then we'll get to our conversation with Don. The icebreaker, and Don, you have some time to think about this, but please, uh, when we start talking, we'd love to hear yours as well. What is your favorite alternative use of parking space? So I'm going to turn it over to Bubba to answer that question and give us an update on state measures. Bubba. Thanks, Michael. Um, my favorite alternative use of a parking space, I think, is for protest. Um, when people kind of occupy a parking space with like a little parklet or um, to either protest bad infrastructure or traffic violence. I think that's a really creative and interesting thing to do. Um, yeah, so let's let's dive into some really exciting and positive uh, updates on some awesome state bills. Um, so just as a reminder, a bill, a state bill um, has to go through two houses, the assembly and the state Senate, just like, uh, you know, similar to the two houses of our federal government before it arrives at the governor's desk. Um, and within those two houses, you have your policy committees like the Committee on Transportation or the Committee on Housing or, or you know, so on and so forth. And it has to go through sometimes multiple of those committees before it goes to the fiscal committee of that house. So that's called the Appropriations Committee. And then it will go to that, you know, that house's floor for a vote before pr proceeding to the next house. So that's kind of the, the maze we've built here. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we do have some really good, exciting news. Um, so the cameras on bus, there, there's a, a bill to um, permit uh, transportation agencies to put cameras on their buses to uh, automatically ticket uh, those parked in bus only lanes. Um, that we actually haven't heard back from. It's supposed to go to the Judiciary Committee yesterday, and I cannot for the life of me figure out uh, what happened to it. But we're hoping that got passed out of the committee and is going to the appropriations but here's what did get passed out of their uh, out of the transportation committee yesterday, which is super exciting, and uh, Streets for All had a had a hand in this with our calls to action. The bicycle safety stop allowing uh, cyclists to use uh, stop signs as yield signs, um, and uh, that's shown to actually uh, improve safety conditions for cyclists, um, as well as decriminalizing jaywalking, which we know uh, was jaywalking was really a fabrication of the car companies to blame traffic violence and pedestrian deaths on, um, on pedestrians themselves rather than on car companies. Um, so that decriminalizing jade walking, both of those bills were passed out of the transportation committee and are heading to the appropriations committee. And so is giving cities flexibility and setting their own speed limits. Um, right now there's an archaic law that sort of um, makes it very difficult for cities to have control over their own speed limits. Uh, so that's very exciting. And that would allow LADOT to um, lower over 200 miles of our own speed limits almost instantly. Um, so that's exciting. And active an active transportation program for regional agencies that would require uh, regional governments and transportation programs to um, basically assess how certain projects or how all projects um, help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that also passed as well as giving cities power over the social streets programs and allowing them to make those permanent, um, AB 773, in an e-bike rebate program, which was originally just a shell program with no money in it, that uh, now has a $10 million uh, to start, uh, yeah, a program to give uh, people rebates when they uh, buy an e-bike instead of when they buy an electric car. Um, and then abolishing parking minimums around transit also passed out of its respective committees and is heading to um, the Appropriations Committee. And that's really exciting. So that's within a half mile around, uh, of transit. So great news on this front, and we'll continue to monitor these. And if you wanna get involved in this effort, please go to streetsforall.org slash get dash involved. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I'll send it to Josh to talk about destruction for nada. Thank you, Bubba. Um, my favorite uh, alternative use of parking is probably just some on-street bike corrals or even a metro bike station. It's great to see. So I'm going to give some quick updates on our Destruction for Nada Coalition effort. 
this is um, a group of orgs and we're trying to stop all freeway widening projects in LA County. Um, LA Walks just joined. We didn't quite get the graphic updated. Um, and if you wanna learn more, you can go to destructionfornada.com. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, we released a 10 minute documentary um, and in, in the last month, it's gotten almost 70,000 views. So there's clearly an appetite to talk about the externalities and different impacts of how freeway expansion projects have uh, damaged or continue to damage different places in LA County. If you go to the next slide, um, recently Spectrum News interviewed Alex Contreras to talk about how the I-5 expansion project that's being planned through Downey will impact their neighbors and nearby parks and schools. Um, and that's a great watch. If you wanna watch either of these, you can go to youtube.com slash streets for all. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Michael to talk about a recent meeting at the Gateway Cities COG. Thanks, Josh. Uh, my favorite alternative use of parking during the pandemic for LA Al Fresco for one block on Melrose uh, near where I live, they uh, let the restaurants use the sidewalk and then they uh, took all of the parking, put some crash barriers between uh, the left side and the curb and basically made parking space for people to walk. And I used it as a one block protected bike lane. Much better use of parking. Uh, so what is a COG? Uh, COG stands for Council of Governments. This is something in our uh, local political structure that most people have never heard of but COGS have a tremendous amount of influence over regional bodies like Metro. And so if we wanna stop freeway widening under destruction for NADA, we actually need to also convince COGS who then don't lobby Metro to continue to widen freeways. The Gateway Cities COG in particular has traditionally loved freeway widening projects. And also they usually have sleepy meetings which is one or two public commenters maybe. Um, so they were, I think, surprised when we along with our coalition partners were able to get over 40 people to the last Gateway Cities COG meeting last week and nearly unanimously spoke against further widening within the Gateway Cities. And it was amazing to see people from places like Cudahy and other places within Gateway Cities that, again, traditionally have seen uh, freeway widening as a way to solve gridlock, um, actually come out against freeway widening. And um, there was actually a very robust discussion over several hours of the board um, and it was very divided, which is progress. So many, many cities spoke up and we think that's huge uh, progress and we're gonna continue to uh, keep the heat on until we can modernize these COGS, which will then give better advice to Metro and lobby for better things. I am now gonna turn it over to Karenig to talk about the Metro Highway Program. And if Karenig is not, is Karenig here guys? Otherwise I don't think I can... so. Okay, I will, I will talk about the Metro Highway Program. Um, so uh, we were part of an effort to modernize the Metro Highway Program. And um, this was a really big effort at the Metro board level to give Metro more flexibility in how they spend highway dollars. So previously these dollars couldn't be used for things like bus lanes, transit improvements, active transportation. But as a result of this motion being passed now at the board, um, they can. This is a really, really exciting step forward and um, we're proud of the Metro board and we're excited to see how this can actually make a difference within Metro's projects and uh, modernizing even the highway program staff thinking about things. I'm now gonna turn it over to Baba to talk about the Culver City Pride Ride. Thanks. Um, so we had a really exciting event that um, Streets for All co-hosted um, alongside Bike Culver City. Um, in three weeks, we were able to organize Culver City's very first uh, Pride celebration. And of course, because Bike Culver City and, and Streets for All were involved, we decided to make uh, Culver City's first Pride a Pride ride. Um, and it was awesome. We, uh, yeah, in three weeks, we got over 130 um, cyclists to, uh, you know, and families to come out and join us. We did a six and a half mile um, route uh, from Sid Cornenthal Park in Culver City. Um, all the way to Culver City High School and then to uh, City Hall. And we ended uh, at City Hall with a rally um, advocating for a more inclusive city. So, you know, a network of bus and bike lanes, making transit free, um, stop oil drilling, um, allow for more housing, um, you know, fund our communities that, and, and so 
uh, it was really just a really great community event that we're hoping to um, really expand upon next year and um, have an even bigger crowd. But it, it was awesome. And thank you to everybody who came and thank you to all of our awesome speakers and everyone who supported this, this event. And I'll turn it over to Adrian. Thanks, Bubba. So my preferred use of a parking space is for a parklet. And I live in Koreatown. We are the most park poor neighborhood in Los Angeles and have been fighting for a park for a while. So even a parklet would be great. And that's also a great segue for this next win of the month. Streets for All has been awarded a grant from SCAG as part of their Go Human project. And we are using that grant for the K-Town Block Party. We're working with uh, some great organizations like Walk and Rollers and the Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council uh, to host an event on August 14th from 1 to 5 p.m. on 6th Street between Alexandria and Catalina. There's gonna be cultural entertainment, community organizations that will have tables there, uh, pop-up park demonstrations and other safe street infrastructure pop-up uh, projects as well too. It's gonna to be a super cool event. And this is also gonna be a, a way for us to collect feedback on a bigger initiative that we support, the Reimagine Sixth Street project. This currently is what Sixth Street looks like. It's a beautiful street with some really historic architecture, but ultimately it's a car sewer. The sidewalks are too narrow. There's a lot of blind spots and it's on the high injury network. We envision it to look something like this, much more human centric, a place where people can gather, have fun and, and really have a community space. And this would help the community reduce its traffic violence, give much needed open space, and it would also boost the small businesses that really make up that corridor. So in addition to all those other great things that I listed, we are gonna be collecting feedback as well too. And we need some volunteers to help with that, uh, including outreach leading up to the event, setup and breakdown, trash management, photography and documentation, and tabling. So uh, if you are interested in volunteering, you can email me at adrian at streetsforall.com. There is only one N in my name. So if you get that bounce back to you, um, it's spelled the way on the screen. So I'm gonna to toss it over to Kyle, who's going to uh, introduce the guest for our next happy hour in August. Thanks, Adrian. Um, to jump into my uh, favorite alternative parking use, I'm gonna hop into the, uh, uh, add on to the parklet movement, but in a, a unique way. There's a guy um, in Warwickshire County, England, um, who built a little parklet in front of his building uh, during the first uh, uh, wave of the pandemic last year um, as a way to just give people more space in the area. And they removed it for safety concerns, uh, which really translated to one person's concern about losing a parking spot. But then he came back and parked his uh, flatbed truck there, a small flatbed uh, Vespa truck, I think, and uh, put the parklet on top of the flatbed. So technically now it was uh, in code. And so that type of uh, uh, protest uh, and like a, a, a guerrilla activity is something that always uh, gets me excited, especially as a designer looking for ways to uh, uh, interact with the built environment. And so that's just really cool. So um, we're excited for next month of having uh, Laura Friedman on, um, a, a noted advocate of uh, our uh, causes, uh, Bikes to Work. Um, and of course, with all of the bills that we're tracking, it's gonna be a really good time to check in on those and have those conversations uh, more in depth with her. So join us next month for Laura Friedman. Um, and now we have something very special for this month. Trivia. So um, I will be posting uh, the link to our trivia in just a moment so you can uh, hop in uh, and uh, by answering a, a few questions about uh, our topic for this month, parking, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a chance to win uh, Donald Shoup's uh, book, The High Cost of Free Parking. First place will get a signed hard copy, and second and third place will get an e-copy. So I'll give you guys just a moment to get ready. As I drop the link to um, uh, the, the quiz in the chat here and on Facebook Live.
Say when, Cal. One second. Sorry, just uh, going a little slow. All right, and um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide and start the timer. So we're gonna give everybody 60 seconds and announce the winners um, after our curated Q&A with Don. Here we go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if this video doesn't work, Kyle, why don't you start a timer just in case? Okay. There we go. If you, if you answered, I think that's kind of cheating, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am so excited to introduce Professor Donald Shoup. Um, Don Shoup is a distinguished research professor in the Department of Urban Planning at the University of California in Los Angeles. His research has focused on transportation, public finance, and land economics. With emphasis on how parking policies affect cities, the economy, and the environment, in his landmark 2005 book, The High Cost of Free Parking, Shoup recommended that cities should, number one, charge fair market prices for on-street parking, number two, spend the revenue to improve public services in the metered neighborhoods, and number three, remove off-street parking requirements. In his 2018 book, Parking in the City, Shoup and his co-authors examine the results where cities have adopted these policies. The successful outcomes show this trio reforms may be the simplest, cheapest, and fastest way to improve city life, protect the environment, and promote social justice. Don, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for inviting me. I was afraid you'd never ask. Well, we finally did. My first question is the icebreaker question. What is your favorite use of, uh, a, a alternative use of a parking space? Well, I've had uh, about five minutes to think about this, and I think the, the best use I've seen is to plant street trees in the parking lane. Uh, some cities do that already, and that goes well with uh, uh, restaurants in the, in the parking spaces as well. So you're, you, you're, you're eating under trees. Um, I think that, uh, that a lot of people would like this, that, uh, whether, and I think that London had the best idea to figure out what's the best use of curb parking spaces. They, instead of going to have a public meeting, saying, well, what should we do with the curb parking, which would bring out all the angry drivers, uh, what they did was survey people, a representative group, and in that group, uh, for a thousand people, parking was the fifth most important use. And the most important use was to uh, uh, use it as green space. So I think if you asked everybody, and not just drivers, uh, you would get a, a, a much better, a more representative uh, idea of what we should do with the curb. Why have you dedicated so much of your professional life to parking? Why is this topic so critical for cities to get right? Uh, well, uh, parking is the uh, single biggest use of land in the cities. The footprint of parking is greater than the footprint of housing or factories or offices or even roads. That, uh, and it, it, what we have done wrong with, with, with parking is that we have assumed it should be 
uh, in most cases free and an amenity for people like trash collection or or street cleaning but it isn't like that at all it's a, it's a, it's a use of the of the curb and uh, for free and some of the most valuable land on earth so we have free parking and expensive housing we've got it just the, the wrong way around i think that uh, I've had the topic, or I did have the topic to myself for a long time, because it's such a low status thing to study. I think in, in academia, you know, we talk about equality a lot, but we're very hierarchical with the chancellors and deans and provosts and professors and assistant professors and even juniors and sophomores. And the, it's very hierarchical. Um, uh, but uh, and that's also true of the things that you study, you know, national affairs are important, uh, so international affairs, state affairs are a step down, the local governments are parochial. So what is the lowest status that you could study in, in, in cities that would be working? So I've been a bottom fee to learn, and now it's almost a feeding frenzy. A lot of people are interested in parking. Uh, and um, I, I'm glad to see it uh, <laughs> leading to an invitation to talk to you. How does LA parking policies compare with other large metro areas in the US and what could we learn from other cities in the US around the world? Well, I think uh, unfortunately our parking policies are pretty typical. Um, um, that uh, we require lots of off-street parking. Uh, if the curb parking is free, cities have to require a lot of off-street parking uh, because if there's any new development that doesn't have ample off-street parking, the curb will get crowded with free parkers and the rest of us will say, how did you let this happen? So in order to minimize complaints from their voters that in, in LA and in most cities, they, they, they keep the curb parking free and require so much off street parking that it won't overcrowd the curb. Uh, uh, but other cities uh, move faster in the right direction. Say San Francisco uh, does just the opposite. It, it, um, it, uh, it, it, it has minimum. Uh, uh, maximum parking limits, not minimum parking requirements. Um, so say for a concert hall downtown, like our famous Disney Hall, uh, LA requires 50 times more parking spaces at the minimum than San Francisco allows as the maximum. So uh, when you go to Disney Hall, most people drive straight into the underground garage, six levels. Um, uh, which cost over a hundred billion dollars to build. Uh, and you take an escalator cascade up into the lobby and you, you've never set foot on a sidewalk. Uh, but at the equivalent hall in San Francisco, Luis Davies Hall, uh, there's no parking. Uh, there's only a maximum allowed and they didn't build any. So at the end of any concert, everybody is out on the sidewalk. Um, and walking to their car if they even drove at all the bookstores and flower shops and bars and restaurants are, are open. It's a much livelier place. Uh, that's why downtown San Francisco is much livelier than Los Angeles. Uh, so I think that, that it's interesting to compare Los Angeles to other cities because um, even in downtown, we still have minimum parking requirements. Uh, Houston doesn't have them, but we're, we have to catch up to what, what the, the, uh, the, the smarter cities are doing. Do you think we're the most behind large city in the US? Oh, no. Um, uh, I would say that you know, Phoenix <laughs> has uh, uh, high parking requirements and extremely wide streets. Well, what LA has is an advantage is we have a lot of housing and commercial areas that, ex that came into existence before there were minimum parking requirements. Um, and that's why the, the most built, the, the picture you showed of Koreatown, uh, that was certainly built before the city began requiring parking. It would never be allowed again. I mean, if you wanted to build that now, it would be strictly forbidden. Um, 
because it doesn't look like it has any parking at all. Um, so you can't have a street of shops. Uh, you have to have the parking as well. Uh, so I think that, uh, that LA is not the worst, partly because we have uh, so much that is older. One of the, the, the biggest lessons that I learned was when in, in downtown LA on Spring Street and Broadway, uh, we have the, the what's said to be the largest collection of intact office buildings from the early 20th century, you know, Beaux-Arts, uh, modern buildings, uh, just terrific buildings. Um, uh, but they didn't have much parking because uh, they were built um, before the car was uh, as prominent as it is now. And, and LA had an unusual urban renewal program. Instead of tearing it down and rebuilding it, they, they just moved it downtown to Bunker Hill. It tore down a wonderful residential area and, and rebuilt it or replanned it as a, as, as a downtown. And so the old downtown, which was called the Wall Street of the West, was just left to molder. It, it turned into sweatshops for a while. But even that didn't pay. So a lot of the buildings were empty above the ground floor, very lively at the ground floor, but not above that. And you couldn't convert it to any other use because you didn't have, they didn't have parking. You can't, you couldn't turn it into housing because the city required two parking spaces per dwelling unit for a condominium. Uh, but then it was a very clever uh, urban planner at LA, Alan Bell, who said, well, what about this allowing a conversion of these, these distressed office buildings into housing without any new parking? And some people said, oh, this will be a disaster. Nobody will lend for a conversion for a building that doesn't have a lot of parking. And, uh, banks will lend for if you want to get a mortgage on one of the condos. Nobody would want to buy one. Uh, they said it'll be a disaster, although the only disaster would be nothing would happen. But as soon as the law was passed, and, and uh, I think 1998, this terrific boom in terms of converting these wonderful old buildings into wonderful new, uh, new apartment buildings uh, took off. There were about 57 new office buildings, and then not new office buildings, and converted office buildings in the next uh, eight years, uh, over 7,000 apartments. Um, and only because LA allowed it, uh, uh, allowed somebody to convert it into, into housing without any uh, new parking. So I think just getting out of the way is, is one of the major contributions that planners can make. What, do you, what city in the US do you think is doing the best job of this? Well, uh, San Francisco is doing a good job. Seattle is doing a good job. Uh, Minneapolis is starting to do a very good job. Uh, uh, for all, I'd say, yes, but most of the, the, the really uh, advanced cities are Amsterdam or Copenhagen or uh, London is, is at the head of it. Paris, I guess. If you're looking at a city that was making great, great advances at a short time, it would be Paris. The mayor has, <laughs> has um, uh, said she want to get rid of, <laughs> remove 70,000 on-street parking spaces and convert them into, into restaurants, uh, to bike lanes, and many other better uses. So I guess if I were going to point to a, a city that has made a big change in a short time, is continuing to do so, I would say it would be Paris. And Paris was the first city, I'm sorry, that I saw uh, these uh, uh, outdoor restaurants with uh, street trees planted in the, in the curb lane. Um, and they were just wonderful places. Two, questions, two more questions, and then we're going to get to our trivia winners in the audience. Um, I was in Tokyo a couple of years ago, and I re it was just really pleasant to walk down the street. And it didn't really hit me why until I realized there is no on-street parking in Tokyo. And my understanding is if you want to buy a car, you have to prove that you have an off-street place to put it. Um, do, you, do you like that model? Do you think that uh, we should not have on-street parking and all parking should be off-street? Well, I've never been to Tokyo, but I've uh, talked to parking experts there and I've read the materials and you've got it exactly right. There, there's um, every, most people know about the fact that you have to have a, uh, a documentation that you have an off street parking space before you can buy a car. You have to show you either own one or you have rented one uh, before you can buy a car. 
In addition to that, they absolutely prohibit any uh, on-street parking overnight. Um, you think, well, why do they have to do both of those? And that's because even, even in Tokyo, somebody could uh, get a forged document saying they have a, um, uh, an off-street parking space or they rented one and stopped renting it. And then they would want to park on the street. But if you if you can't park overnight, there's no point <laughs> in, in, in trying to, to, to own a car without an off-street parking space. And then during the daytime, most um, on-street parking is prohibited. It's part because the streets are so narrow. They're making that they... So I think I should have said this earlier. Some people think that Tokyo has the best parking policies on earth, meaning uh, le less parking than per square mile than, than any other city. And the, the other thing that they do that's, that's very smart is they don't require much off street parking, but they allow anybody to convert uh, a surface land that they have uh, into a, what they call a coin parking lot. You could, uh, if it's less than 500 square meters, you don't even need the city's permission. You just, that they have very clever parking meters where you park in the, in the lot and you can't remove your car unless you, until you have paid for your parking. It's really, uh, it's locked in. Uh, and it's unmanned as well. Uh, so I, I guess I would say that Tokyo is certainly uh, uh, very different from, from the United States, obviously, it's so much bigger and denser. So I don't think we're, uh, given our, our physical shape now, it, it wouldn't, we, LA couldn't quickly develop something like that. Uh, because we have so much on street space, our streets are so wide. We've built the city. I mean, we've planned the city for people who drive everywhere. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to see us uh, aim for something like Tokyo or Paris, but it'll be a long haul. How do you, so we do a lot of advocacy work and it is so exhausting trying to convince businesses that the world won't end if the street parking in front of their business is converted to a bus lane, to a bike lane, to other use. Um, it, it is a myth that if, if you repurpose parking that automatically businesses die. In fact, uh, there's, I've seen many studies that show that the more walkable and bikeable a street is, the more people frequent it and, and patronize the businesses. How do we debunk this myth in Los Angeles? I don't think I would try to do it at a public meeting. Uh, I, I, um, I, I recommend a different strategy. It's a little, little uh, maybe with a different end that you're aiming for is that I recommend that we should, the first step we should do is what Pasadena has done, old Pasadena. Um, you're too young to know, but it used to be a commercial skid row uh, that uh, it, it it was a uh, the premier shopping center on the West Coast in the early uh, 19th, 20th century. Uh, and in 1929, they, they, they made a, probably an unwise investment in putting a trolley car down the center of Colorado Boulevard, which is the main drag of old Pasadena. And to do that, they had to widen the street by 14 feet on either side. So they had to slice off the first 14 feet of every building. And some people put on a, a new facade, which was um, uh, in, in the style of 1929, which was a great time to, <laughs> to get a building built. Or they were even uh, historic preservationists. They, they cut out some of the center of the building and moved the original facade back uh, 14 feet. So you, the old Pasadena has a, the streetscape is the, is the, 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 the high, high mark of commercial architecture of the United States in 1929. You uh, couldn't do better than that. But then the depression came along and then World War II and then all the, everybody had cars and it faded. Uh, and, uh, people thought it would never come back. It was uh, empty above the ground floor. And all the storefronts were empty. And the, 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 the uh, city, uh, the parking was free on the street. So the city wanted to put in parking meters to to sort of manage the parking, <laughs> but the merchants and, the, and their employees uh, uh, parked, who parked on the street and moved their cars every two hours to avoid getting a ticket. They, they said, oh, you can't do that. It'll chase away all the customers we have. And they fought for a couple of years until 
the city said, all right, if we put in the parking meters, we'll spend all the money to improve the public uh, 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 sector, the sidewalks and the street trees and the historic street furniture in Old Pasadena. All the money would go to pay for public improvements in Old Pasadena. And the merchant said, well, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's run the meters to midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. So the only thing that changed was the destination of the revenue. Instead of disappearing into the general fund and going to pay for pensions for, for who knows whom, it came back in, in, in beautiful sidewalks with uh, cast iron street tree grates, uh, beautiful street trees. They cleaned up the alleys. I'm sure all of you have walked around in Pasadena and walked around in the alleys. I mean, who walks around in the alleys in Westwood <laughs> or any any other place? They've made it a wonderful place to be. They, they borrowed money to replace every single square foot of sidewalks. So it isn't that you look down at the sidewalks and say, oh, gee, this is great. You just like it. You don't know why. And they, they, uh, they get over, a, I think, $1.5 million a year to clean the sidewalks every night, to uh, pressure wash them twice a month, remove graffiti every night. Uh, everything you'd want from the public sector, old Pasadena has. And as soon as the, the, the city came through with all these public investments, then the private property owners restored their buildings, didn't pay any uh, pay to, to restore them in the past because the rents weren't high enough. But it's when the city did what only the city can do, which is to make terrific um, public investments on the sidewalk and in, in the street, then the property owners came through with wonderful restorations. And now it's one of the most popular places to go in Southern California. 30,000 people on an average weekend go to just to walk around in it. Uh, so I'd say that that's one of the, the, the we should, more cities should copy what old Pasadena did. Last question before the audience. In 60 seconds, if you can, you're now the mayor of Los Angeles and you have political power. What changes would you immediately implement here? Well, just what I described at Old Pasadena, for, for one thing, I think that in LA, uh, just in the same year that, that Pasadena put the parking meters into Old Pasadena in 1993, uh, Westwood, uh, which had been by far the more popular place to go, um, uh, was beginning to de decline. And they, they had parking meters that charged a dollar an hour. And the merchants said, well, the, the, everybody said it was so hard to park in Westwood. So what they did is they urged the city to reduce the price at the meters to 50 cents an hour. So if, if they were hard, spaces were hard to find, well, what will we do? Let's cut the price. That'll help. I mean, people's thinking is so so uh, primitive when it comes to uh, to park uh, that so Westwood uh, failed um, uh, and Westwood installed very high parking requirements including a crazy one that if you had a vacant lot and you wanted to build a new building on it you not only had to provide all the required parking you had to replace the parking that was already there so it meant a, a huge amount of parking was required. And Pasadena did just the opposite. It essentially removed all street parking requirements in Pasadena. So Pasadena did exactly the opposite of what LA did. And you could see what happened. Westwood failed from being one of the, the, the finest shopping centers of the West Coast and old Pasadena uh, revived in a way that people thought it never could. So that's well, what maybe, I would suggest to the mayor is to just do what our neighboring cities do. But per city would be another good thing where they built uh, very good public parking structures and charge reasonable. Maybe that's because uh, Westwood has Paul Koretz who loves to say that LA is underparked. That's one of his favorite, favorite things. Um, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and share the trivia winners and then we have some audience questions for you. So, um, Kyle, go ahead. Yeah, so congrats to our winners. Uh, first place, uh, Ryan Cuppin. Uh, second place, Stephen Collins. And third place, Eric Dasmalti. Uh, so we have you guys' emails. Uh, we'll be in contact. Uh, thank you for participating and we hope you enjoy the book. Great. All right, so we're now going to take some questions from the audience. Um, the first question is from David Fenn. 
Um, programs like LA Alfresco and other park programs seem to have popped up all over the, the country, converting street parking to other uses. Do you think that COVID has fast-tracked the adoption of some of your recommendations permanently? Definitely, yes, I think so. Everybody wants to eat outdoors. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the curb lane in, in LA, in most cities, uh, has been dedicated to cars. You know, uh, it, isn't that, uh, it isn't that this land is your land, this land is my land, this land is for you and me. The curb blade is for cars. Uh, and now during the COVID, there are a lot of other things that, that want the lane. And even uh, aside from, from COVID, you know, the delivery drivers want to have space to uh, stop at the curb and um, uh, people want to eat outdoors and um, shared cars want to have parking on the street. Uh, there, and, and bus lanes are important, and bike lanes. There are a lot of other uses for the for the uh, street parking, uh, and the, the, the curb lane can serve all of these, but not at the same time. And I think COVID, uh, not so much in LA as in New York uh, in particular, is that many streets have been converted into walk streets and cafes, and people have seen it. You know that the, this awful. Um, traffic congestion and air pollution have been washed out. And, and the streets are quieter, they're pleasanter, they're safer, they're, everything is better. And I think now we, it, it's easier to argue for these alternative uses of the curb because we've seen them. And if it hadn't been for, for COVID, I think we wouldn't have seen so quickly what this, this other world would be. Eric wants to know, uh, when cars first became common on the streets, was it initially usually free to store one's car on the street? And when did paying to park begin? Yes, it, it was uh, uh, free at the beginning. It seemed natural uh, that if you, were, if you had a car and you felt entitled and you wanted to, and there was an open space at the curb, uh, it wasn't really regulated. Um, and it, but it, uh, after, in the 1920s is when we became a, you know, a, an automotive nation that the, 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 the car became dominant very quickly. So it, 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 I think in, in Los Angeles, it, it, by 1920, more than half of all people going downtown arrived by a car. It happened very quickly. Um, and there was a, a terrific competition for the curb, which led to off-street parking requirements. Um, but the parking meter wasn't invented until 1935. So it's understandable that it wasn't charged for. Uh, and people, people Drivers bitterly opposed them. Uh, they said it was unconstitutional. Went all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court <laughs> okayed parking meters. Fortunately, it was very clever what the parking uh, meter manufacturers did. They 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 gave them to the city for free, uh, but they kept all the revenue until they were paid for. Uh, Say so there was no upfront cost to the city. Is that the the, it only took, took about six months for the meter revenue to pay for the meters. And they also put the meters in just on one side of the street and not on the other. So you could see what a difference it made on the, when the, if the curb parking is free, people who worked on the street would get there very early to find a space to stay all day. But on the other side, they could see the cars kept coming and going and there were customers arriving. So it, it, it wasn't until 1935, I think, that we began uh, charging for, uh, for for curb parking, but it, 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 it and it spread very quickly throughout the country. But only in in downtowns. Um, and it, I'm afraid it's the rest of the world that has has um, gotten ahead of us in terms of uh, uh, doing the right thing with the curb, especially in Europe. Okay, um, <clears throat> David again asked a really good question. I've never seen um, other cities with their public transportation build massive parking structures at new stations. Um, so paid or not, is there any excuse to be putting parking lots at prime locations near transit investments in 2021? And before you answer that, I'm hearing that there's something wrong with the q and It's saying it's closed. I don't know why. Um, I will try to fix it, but if not, just go ahead and put questions in the chat and we'll get to those too. So what do you think, Don? 
Well, I think that uh, certainly with the new purple line, there are going to be no new parking structures uh, associated with uh, stops. And people think that's you know crazy. How can you use <laughs> how can you use transit if there's no place to park your car? Uh, so I think the LA is moving in, in the right direction, uh, but not in the suburbs. That uh, I, I don't think any parking structure should be built unless the the, the drivers uh, pay for the parking, uh, pay it pay enough to 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 uh, uh, justify the parking. And Culver City has made a a, a big uh, 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 move in the right direction. You know, it used to be the end of the Expo line, and there was a huge surface parking lot. Um, and now they've uh, built over that parking lot. Uh, so I think that if it's if it's surface parking, it's easy enough to to convert it into, into higher higher value uses with high density housing or commercial areas. Uh, and uh, when you say like in Westwood, <laughs> there's plenty of Wall Street parking in Westwood um, already there. If people want to use it, they just have to pay for it. Sorry, I was on mute. How can we incentivize shopping centers to use parking for building housing? Well, it's already happening um, that, uh, that, that that some shopping centers have failed and been converted into into uh, uh, new housing, um, and others have been able to. Um, uh, uh, build uh, what, what the newer word is called liner buildings. They build housing or, 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 or any kind of building around the perimeter of the parking lot. But again, the city has to allow it. Uh, the, the, we, we don't incentivize the shopping center to use parking for building housing. We prohibit it with minimum parking requirements. You know, the typical for a park, shopping center has to five, have five parking spaces for every thousand square feet. And that's a, a, a parking lot about 40% bigger than the shopping uh, area. Uh, so if as soon as you remove the off street parking requirements, the, 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 the owner can say, well, maybe this this land could be the perimeter of it would be much more valuable um, as, as housing, which is so expensive, uh, rather than empty parking spaces. So I think the, the way you incentivize shopping centers to use parking for building housing is to allow it. I, I have an egregious example. Uh, I live near Melrose and, and Formosa. And on Formosa, a couple of blocks up, there are two massive parking podiums, uh, parking structures. And one of them has been empty for years. I don't know what's going on there. And there's people living in tents right in front of it. And I can't help but think that there is such a better use of that seven stories of parking that it, it, it's especially great. It doesn't even have a single car. Um, we could probably solve homelessness pretty quickly if we use a lot of that space. Well, yeah, some, some cities, have, well, they allow it, the parking garages can be converted into, into housing. It's not a conventional kind of housing, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's some rather handsome apartments could be fitted into a podium, at least around the perimeter. Bubba wants to know, how do we convince cities that removing parking to use the space in better ways is not too politically risky? Well, I think uh, you ought to ask uh, Laura Friedman this uh, next next month because she has sponsored a bill that prohibits uh, uh, cities from uh, requiring any off street parking within a half mile walk of, uh, of, of a major transit stop, meaning a rail transit stop or where there. Uh, the uh, crossing of two lines that have operated more than 15 minute headways. Um, and when you look at this uh, with GIS, that's a huge uh, part of the city of Los Angeles. So it would prohibit Los Angeles from requiring parking, meaning that, that the parking requirements would be uh, uh, just removed by, by state level. And the reason I think uh, that it's happening at the state level rather than at the local level is because the, at the, at, they're not, the NIMBYs are not as important in the legislature. Uh, the uh, NIMBYs will go to their council member and say, no, don't let this happen. Uh, like Paul Koretz as opposed <laughs> to Laura Finnegan's uh, 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 bill. Uh, but at the state level, they can look at the bigger 
uh, consequences of parking requirements. Look, well, how does it affect traffic congestion? How does it affect carbon emissions? I mean, we're we, we committed ourselves to reducing carbon emissions in California. Uh, how do parking requirements affect carbon emissions? Well, they, they, they greatly <laughs> increase them because it means that nothing can be built without ample, essentially free parking free parking to the driver. The cost doesn't go away just because the driver doesn't pay for it. Somebody has to pay for it. The cost is still there. And if it's for housing, uh, it gets included in the rent for the apartment. Even if you don't own a car, if you rent it a, an apartment in a building that has two parking spaces or whatever dwelling, you, you are paying for that parking in your rent, even if you can't afford a car. So I think at the state level, they can look at these bigger picture issues. Um, and say, well, how does it affect uh, the architecture? How does it affect the cost of housing? How does it affect everything? And, if, and, and at the state level, it, it, it's much more obvious that parking requirements are a bad idea. And so it's, it's crept through the legislature. I think it's, that, that, that was a nice diagram you had at the beginning, but it's in its last committee in yeah. And at, the, at the state level, uh, then it would have to go to the the uh, I say the Senate, and then if the Senate passes it, it's almost there. So it, it's odd, and it's often passed by uh, unanimously in these committees. So I think that the, when you stand back and, and, and don't listen to the the, the nimbies pressing at you, that you can see that this is, the parking requirements are inconsistent with, well, we give the cities billions of dollars for transit, and like in LA, we require ample off-street parking right at the transit stops. Say, at, at UCLA, there are 180 buses arrive and leave during the peak hour at UCLA. And right across the street from UCLA, the city requires three and a half parking spaces uh, for every dwelling unit if it has more than four rooms. So I think you, you could see if you're at the federal level or the state levels, uh, why are we giving all this money to people when everybody expects to, to park free at home and wherever they go? Uh, I really like this question. Um, we talk about parking being part of the lizard brain that makes normal folks irrational. Is there a lizard brain equivalent you found to argue against the proliferation of parking? against the, the well to, to refute it well i don't think i think that that most people uh, when they think about parking they use the the, the, the what's said to be the, the reptilian cortex of the brain is the most primitive part of the brain that it developed first to make snap decisions like how to avoid being eaten or or how to um, uh, win in a battle uh, and the parking is very territorial, uh, that it is it's very primitive in, in uh, staking out a claim. And the, the, the reptilian part of your brain said to be uh, to affect uh, dominance, and, uh, ritual display, and things like that, all that's important in parking. Uh, but I haven't thought of any people using the reptilian cortex to, argue against parking. It's more that if, 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 you're, if you're making snap decisions, if you, what they call slow thinking, uh, rather than rapid thing. If you think about it slowly and think, well, what is the right way to have the parking? I don't think you would say, well, we ought to have more of it. We shouldn't allow anything to happen unless it has plenty of parking. Is there a fiscal disincentive for cities to remove parking and lose the opportunity to collect fines and, and meter revenue? And are there any creative or well-received ways to make up for that lost revenue? Well, I'm not talking about removing parking. I'm talking about charging for what we have. Um, and that would generate revenue. As I said, old Pasadena gets over a million and a half dollars a year to pay for cleaning the sidewalks and removing graffiti. And they advertise for the area. They do street lights at Christmas time. And they do every, they act like a shopping center. You know, a shopping center like Century City, they spend an immense amount of money cleaning the place up and, and making it look good. Uh, so that, so that people will enjoy being there. So I think that uh, if you, the incentive is to charge for parking and, and use the, the money 
to approve the area. And of course, uh, that the, it, it does allow you to give tickets if people don't pay. Um, uh, you have to, you have to enforce it. Uh, but I think the the the, 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 the relying on tickets for par for revenue, which LA does, about $150 million a year, is a bad kind of uh, a source of revenue because it, it only comes from a violation from double parking, for example. Do you want to have more people double parking so we can give tickets? No, I think it'd be better to charge for the right price for, for curb parking. There, there was an interesting study in New York that looked at the effect of, of charging for parking on on uh, double parking that uh, they found that if you if you had a, a, a several at any block where all the spaces were occupied there was usually some double parking uh, and if you had just five percent of them vacant you know which was very low um, uh, vacancy rate the the, the 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 number of parking violations fell by half so if all the spaces are full, you're bound to have double parking or parking at bus stops or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but if you charge the right price, and, and, and that does a lot of damage, that um, that uh, there was one, one study on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood found that over half the time, Uber and Lyft drivers had to load and unload people in the, in the, in the traffic lane because all the curb spaces were occupied. And it, it was not, that's not safe getting in and out of a car uh, in traffic and it is effectively double parking so it greatly reduces the capacity of the street so i think charging the right price meaning the the, the lowest price the city could charge and still have one or two open spaces on every block is, is easy to explain uh, that that's hard to say there should be another you have another uh, principle that you could say this is what you should charge. I think you should say this is my time is just the lowest price the city could charge and still have one or two open spaces. So so the curb is well used. Most of the spaces are occupied uh, and is readily available. Wherever you go, you'll see one or two open spaces. And I've never heard anybody say, well, I've got a better idea. Do you think that residential street parking should be priced? If it's scarce, like in Koreatown, you know, that uh, the older areas that uh, that were built without a lot of parking, yes, I, I, I think that that should definitely happen. Uh, and again, I think if you charge for the on-street parking, you should spend the money to improve the sidewalks and to improve the area, just like in old Pasadena. So, so mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Please finish. Um, so last question, I, I know we're basically out of time. Um, a politician goes to a city council meeting and says, we're going to properly price parking in your area. And therefore, it's going to be market rate and uh, the cost is basically going to go up. And you live in a dense part, so we're going to price the residential street. And residents yell and scream and say, uh, why are you making my life more difficult? I've got to get to work. We don't have transit everywhere yet. I'm, there's no bike lanes everywhere yet. Uh, how do you answer those those very nimby and reactive responses? I'd answer it the way Pasadena did and say, if we start charging for parking, we'll spend all the money in your neighborhood. And then the people who don't park on the street, which who were a vast majority, most people just physically can't park on the street. If you go to Koreatown, you look at the, the all the apartment buildings, take five percent. But those five percent are the ones who will show up at a meeting and say, "Don't what you were saying." But what about the ninety-five percent? If they think that you mean we could get our sidewalks fixed and uh, we could it could be safer and uh, better lit uh, and cleaner, that then you would get the ninety-five percent of the people say, "Well, yes, uh, I like this idea." Makes sense. Well, I think we're out of time. Uh, Don, any, any last words you'd like to add? Well, thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, I, I think I'm always willing to talk about parking. And I think you, you've done it at the right time, especially since you'll have um, uh, Assembly Member Flanagan uh, uh, next month, because there, there's a lot happening in this field. And it, 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 it can make the, the world a much better place very quickly.
Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so yeah, Laura Friedman, uh, August 11th, 5 p.m. And um, Don, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate it. No, thanks for inviting me. All right. Good night, everybody. Farewell.